it. <clears throat> wow. <laughs> this 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 is what normally happens when we used to have our face to face Lohotla. But this is the new normal. We do things online and uh, we reach out to the bigger audience. Welcome to our monthly Lohotla. Uh, we always have a particular theme that we address uh, through the Lohotla. And, and today it's, uh, it's the public relations and communications network, the Lohotla way. What it means is that we use the Lohotla approach, but we're going to tackle the topic of, of, of public relations and communications. And, and for that, we, we're going to kick off uh, with a guest speaker, our friend, uh, uh, Boniwe. And, and, and she's, she's not going to give you one of those typical lectures. You know, when you go to conferences and this presentation, it's just, it's just lots and lots of uh, 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 material. She's going to share with us uh, how her professional journey started. You know, it started uh, with her wanting to become a public relations uh, professional and it took a different turn. And she's going to share with us how that happened and how actually the basic of public relations and communication assist her in her current role of uh, being a human resources professional. Often we think that the things we have studied are not relevant to the jobs we end up doing. But in reality, that is, that, that is not the case. And, and I, I'm really looking forward to hear from uh, Boniwe. Uh, uh, how is public relations uh, 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 content applied in a, a current role where she works as an HR professional? Uh, so that we can really link uh, our 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 thinking around this topic is a practical reality. But before we do that, uh, obviously we have to do the the, the logical steps of the hotla, which is checking in, and from there we remind ourselves of the methodology, and then of course only way comes in, and then we can then going to go into the the other the other uh, sessions, which will be the mini hotlas and uh, and the other lineups that I've. I've, I've put forward to, to the menu. So for now, let's just take it easy and uh, check in. You know, uh, maybe maybe uh, I should should I start or does anyone want to start first? You can lead the pack, sir. Does I lead the pack? <laughs> You've been elected to lead the pack. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I just want to connect with you, colleagues. It's always a, a pleasure to be at the Lechotla. We have it on a Saturday morning, no pressure. Uh, it's really like a, a community. And today we decided to extend the community by connecting with those out there that want to be part of us. My name is Sam Zima. For those who might not know me, uh, uh, my, my, my name is very synonymous with Comesa. Yeah, uh, I always say that that I do what Kometa does. Uh, I'm looking in from Houten province of South Africa. For those who don't know South Africa, Houten province is where we find our big city, Johannesburg. But I actually don't live in, in, in the town, in the city itself. I live outside the city. But we always say Johannesburg because then, then people can relate. I, I, I'm much more closer to Campton Park, uh, very close to the International Airport, OR Tambo International. So that's where we find ourselves. And the uh, weather today is beautiful. If, if you are in the cold zones of the northern regions, uh, we are about to arrive into winter, but uh, it's beautiful. Uh, I think uh, today the sun, is, the sky is clear. The sun is shining, and I'm trying to bring that inside me so that I can sort of like emit that to the outside. Uh, what do I do? As I said, I do what Kometa does. I'm a coach uh, on my day-to-day -day work. I'm a facilitator, but then I lead the business uh, of Kometa. 
And of course, today I will be facilitating our, our Lekhotla. Body, mind, spirit. Um, I must say, I, I, I'm a little bit heavy. My shoulders are a bit heavy. I think uh, I could, if I did what Ndade Monakota did and went for a run, I could be feeling much better. I'm not a runner, I must, I must admit. I do a bit of stretches here and there. I'm conscious of what I eat. And that's how I tried not to overload my body. My mind, um, I, I practice mindfulness. And, and that has taught me to try to be with, with the present. And, 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 and it works like a charm, you know. I, I, I hate it when I find myself being in a space and my mind being somewhere else. And then I start saying that, but my mindfulness practice, my mindfulness meditation practice is letting me down. So a number of times I, I, I find myself succeeding in being fully present with what I'm busy with. So, so, but I, I enjoyed the little chit chat we had earlier on during our, our coffee hour, uh, whereby we, we throw anything into the basket and we talk about it. And I, I was fascinated. My mind moved from one topic to another. We started talking about the history. And then we started talking about the, the companies that disappeared from the surface of the earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, so, so it's amazing. So, so my mind right now is just preoccupied with what we are about to do. And then I'm feeling the energy, but uh, I see slowly getting there, but I'm feeling the energy that you are giving me. So, so I'm in good spirits. I'm in good spirits. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to this uh, conversation we are going to have. Uh, maybe I've got the high expectations, but I will tone down my expectations as we go along. <laughs> it's good to have expectations, you know, and then you try to measure them as you go along. So I expect that uh, we're going to use our Lekhotla methodology to really understand public relations and communications for what it is. All of us, we want to connect. All of us, we communicate. All of us, we are communicated to. But I don't think we really think deeply about it. So I, I, I really want to come out of the Lofota today, uh, having decided that this is how I'm going to use the, uh, the insights around public relations communication to enrich my relationship with people. Uh, I think sometimes we make these functions exclusive you must study PR to, to practice PR. I think all of us need PR. All of us have identities. We are the brands of our own. And all of us communicate every day, but I don't think we ever think about what it is that we communicate to people and what does it do? So today I really want to take something that is going to be my practice from now onward. I feel like I know what I want and, uh, and uh, I just want to confirm it. And that's my expectations, uh, Bonnie. <laughs> noted, noted, sir. Um, yeah. Noted. And on that note, I think I might just as full of, I might as well just follow you in terms of uh, my check in. Uh, so for everyone, my name is Bonue. Uh, my name is Bonue Danster. I'm also in Gauteng. Uh, in an area called uh, Sibuke, close to Ferena Heng, for those of you who would actually know the area. And um, I think the weather is beautiful. The sky looks very clear. Uh, I haven't been outside, I must admit, so I'm not sure whether it's cold or hot. Mm -hmm. However, um, it looks beautiful. It's sunny. So the reason that I'm also joining today is also to come and share my experience with you and how I transitioned from public relations into human resources. But we will touch base on that a bit uh, a bit later on. Um, I'm in a good space. I'm in a good space. I'm happy. Um, I'm happy it's weekend. Like weekend always brings happy moods. So um, I'm slightly tired because I actually had a very late night uh, with an assignment submission but that did not deter me from waking up uh, because I was looking forward to this session. I've been looking forward to it for over a month, actually from the day that I was invited. And my expectation today is also for me to learn from you and to get to engage and connect with everybody uh, so that I can continue building relationships and I can continue learning from those around me as well. So thank you. That's my check-in for this morning. And then the body, mind, and spirit, uh, how, how are you doing? 
no, I'm good. My body, mind, spirit, everything, it's everything. It's good. I'm in a good space. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you also have time to meditate. Uh, mindfulness, I wish I could practice that. I practice it in my head, but I haven't actually mastered the art of, like, you know, or perfected the art of doing it, uh, like, um, religiously. But it's one of those things that in my head I do. But other than that, body, mind, and spirit, everything in, in good shape, sir. Yeah. Good, lovely, and thanks for for making time for us. You are our 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 honored guest today, and uh, we are, for that we appreciate. I will hope in next. Uh, yeah, uh, I hear an echo though. Okay, we can hear you very well. Okay, um, some of you will know uh, an artist by the name Bob Marley. He has yeah. a song, sun is shining, weather is clear. <laughs> oh, he was a favorite. Okay, so that yeah. shows you that uh, I'm not uh, 16 years old. I remember artists <laughs> from way back when. <laughs> okay, um, so where am I? I'm in Johannesburg. I'm in Central in a place called uh, Hellingham Manor. And yeah. uh, the sun is shining. And if Sam hadn't dragged me uh, to here to this morning, I would be probably on hole number four, swinging my clubs and enjoying the golf. <laughs> I, I, I love a game of golf. And right now, for those of you who know a bit about it, the Masters Golf Tournament, one of the majors, of the majors. is happening right now. It's mm -hmm. a major, wow. major event. I mean, mm -hmm. if you get that, just, just watch, not, not to understand the golf, just to see the beauty of the golf course. It is yeah. more. And <laughs> we're proud because we've got three South Africans who made the cut. And uh, who knows? Who knows? Something might happen yeah. there. So fingers crossed, folks. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, 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 and one more. The fellow who's leading the tournament, Justin Rose, was born in Johannesburg. He is British, but he was born here. So I think he talent comes from here. The rest is British. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So as I said, the weather is clear. And uh, what do I do? I'm a business life uh, coach, uh, coach executives. Um, I'm also a facilitator. Uh, once in a while, I get speaking engagements, and I love talking about the mind and how. Everyone has it within them to be exceptional. Uh, so I have a YouTube page. Uh, I can share that link. I think I should share it with you. Where I talk motivation, I inspire people. Uh, I also work with a fellow called Bob Proctor. He mm -hmm. is a teacher, a motivator, inspirer. So I am a certified consultant for him. Uh, so I, we have a program we call Thinking into Results, where we help people understand what goals, understand who they are, conscious mind, subconscious mind. I was talking to Sam earlier this morning. He was saying energy. And as you know, uh, energy is neither created or destroyed. It is there. And each one of you has an amazing amount of energy in there. But it takes a thought. To let it out and mm. takes belief in yourself to believe who you are and i believe each one of us here is exceptionally talented exceptionally but you've got to believe that you are for us to see the best of you if you think you are nothing then we will see nothing from you but if you know and you say it loudly that you are the best then we'll see the best from you so I love that kind of thing because I understand. So I'm working with one of the consultants here. They have in, uh, started a magazine called Elevate, Elevation Business Magazine, Able. So I did an article uh, and we talked about the amazing power. It's called Tap Into the Greatest Power in All Creation. And the greatest power in all creation is the mind. God gave you that mind. That's the greatest power of creation. And so we're talking about what it is, how you can tap into it to become a better person. All right. And so, as you can hear, I, I, I can go on for a whole day, but I have to let you guys talk about it as well. <laughs> <laughs> I write things. I'm an author. Uh, as I said, I love facilitating. I love speaking. 
what's my state of being? I, I'm a very positive person. Extremely positive. Sometimes I frustrate people around me. Well, they say, oh, but good, you're putting on an act. I said, no. The best way in life is to understand that when you are low, you're low. And say it. Mm -hmm. hey, at the moment, I'm low. But mm -hmm. understand why you're low. And then say, I'm getting out of it. It's mm -hmm. pointless to stay low because the, mm -hmm. the world is valleys and peaks. You must always be looking out for a peak. Even though you're in the valley, you've got to be look up. And so if you train your mind to understand that, yes, there will be downs, there will be ups. There's what we call the laws of the universe. And one of them is called the law of gender. And one of it, it talks about the ebb and sway of life, that you will have seasons, you'll have winter, you will have autumn, you'll have... Understand yourself to see that no one stays in winter forever, but no one stays in summer all forever. But in the, and understand to navigate between the states to become the best. And what do I expect from my friend Boniwe today? For her to tell me where she's come from, <laughs> what her expectations are. We have formed a great partnership, me and Boniwe, uh, in one of our shows. And I absolutely love working with her because she works hard. And as you can see, I come from the old school that believes that in working hard. But when you work <laughs> hard, you, you get rewarded. <laughs> Anyways, I'm expecting to hear that. And to, to refresh myself also on public relations, a quick story. I was a lawyer in private practice. I was invited to join a listed entity as a legal advisor. But the chairman of that company insisted I went and do a public relations course. Initially, I actually frowned on it and said, oh, man, I'm an attorney. That is the best thing that I ever did. And I can tell you, if, if you ask me time and time again, one of the greatest things that I ever did in my life was to go and do a public relations course, to understand stakeholders, to understand, ah, and I, 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 it was like a duck taking to water. I absolutely loved it, and it changed my life. Right now, I'm more comfortable in that space than anywhere. So when I hear Bodyway talk, she's reminding me of my younger self and the things that I went through. I absolutely love public relations. So yeah, I expect to hear what's going on in the new world now around that and the things that we're going to do. And uh, yeah, that's about it. If you need coaching, let me know. And if you need a round of golf, I'm also <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, that's me. I think, so I think you'll have to start with me, George. Uh, I started and then halfway, I just didn't cope with uh, the discipline of being on the, it was not even a golf course. It's one of these centers here in Woodmead where they take you to Take oh, it, you know. World of yeah. golf. But one thing I love <laughs> about I just love putting alone. You know the putting? Yes, <laughs> Where yes. I'm not and under it... pressure. And when I hit that hole, I get this it's like, it's like I've achieved. <laughs> That's all what I like. But if I have to swing, I it goes its own directions. <laughs> well, that's the discipline. It's it's the, we call it a journey through life, golf. You will have days where everything happens for you. Then when you have days when nothing happens, those are the seasons in life. But remember, yeah. the goal is to always persevere because you'll come right in the end. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, George. Thank you. Okay, so I can pop in. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, yes, um, so good day, everyone. It's um, my name is Janae, and um, I am Janae Young. I am logging in from um, uh, New Jersey, South Jersey, in the United States, on the East Coast. And when I look out my window right now, I see darkness. <laughs> Uh, but it is um, the temperature today is expected to be about 52 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 11 degrees uh, Celsius. So it's supposed to be a nice mild day today, um, later on today. And um, we are going, we are in spring. And so we'll be moving into the summer months. So we're on the opposite side of the of the uh, seasons as uh, you all are. Um, so 
what I do to help out in the world, um, I'm an organizational development practitioner, talent and organizational development practitioner. After spending many years in human resources, my very uh, early start in my career, um, I went from doing the HR operations and some of the HR employee relations and uh, human resources, talent management, to really focusing on how to help talent improve. So we have a lot of things in common with, um, there's a lot in common on the call with life coaching or, or coaching and mentoring, um, but I help organizations and people with career development, with uh, leadership and talent development. I'm really concerned about how to increase uh, performance and to help people have stronger dynamics on teams. When, you, when people do have those stronger dynamics, stronger communication, um, stronger relationships, that does in turn touch productivity and it does in turn improve results um, for whatever part of the team that they happen to be on. So I really enjoy working with the Myers-Briggs type indicator, with emotional intelligence assessments, with DISC assessments. I'm certified to deliver those. Um, those are some of my favorite things to do. If I am checking in on my state, so how am I feeling? Um, I'm feeling I'm feeling pretty good. In a few hours, I'll work on the body and go out to uh, do a little bit of running. I have a little... Uh, run that I'll be participating in later on this month on the 25th. So um, so just get my body prepared for that by going out to run. Um, my mind feels alert and ready to receive the information. Bonnie Way is going to be uh, talking with us today and teaching with respect to public relations. And I'm really looking forward to Bonnie Way's presentation. Uh, we could all learn how to do public relations and to strengthen that. Um, no matter where you are in your journey as a novice or as a master, you can always get a vitamin shot and, and just re-up on the information that'll be helpful to continue to move yourself forward. So my mind is ready to receive receive. It's sharp and ready. I have a, a big gallon of water here to keep me alert and ready. And my spirit, um, I feel like my spirits are high. I feel like things are um, pretty good and feeling grateful that we are as a as a world moving forward through everything we've been through over the last few months and years. So um, I'm ready to receive work on the body and to learn more about public relations and communication. Beautiful. And, and thank you for, for, for waking up this early uh, <laughs> to be with us. We, we really appreciate that. And, and I, I, I promise uh, we, will, we, will, we will play back the same way if you were to stage. A, and I used to, to stay until the early mornings uh, during your elections, uh, just, oh. just, just catching up with what is going on there. And it was quite as a as a non participant. It was always quite very educational. So uh, we will do the same next time you call us to join you for your. <laughs> <laughs> now, I must admit, oh, well, I thank you, and thanks for well. thanks for inviting me. I'm sorry, George. I, yeah. I said I, I did stay up as well with my fingers crossed that Donald will not win. <laughs> <laughs> It was a very tense time. Everybody was was staying up and trying to figure out what was going on. But thank you for inviting yeah. me to the platform today. Okay, great stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Janae. You're welcome. Always welcome, as you know. Thank you. Great. We Who's next? Who's next? <laughs> <laughs> Michael is next. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's great. You, you said what I saw, Bonnie, when. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, my name is Michael Mlava. I'm logging in from Gaudi in Bonaero Park. And the weather is, uh, the sky is clear and it's a little bit sunny. Shows that it's a great day. People are cycling and taking a jog and everything. And what I do is uh, I'm a producer and station manager at Comesa Radio Worldwide. And my body in the morning was a little bit tired together with my mind and spirit. But Sam knows how to take it from gear one to five. So everything's well now equipped and ready for the day. 
Thank you. Great. I hope you will stay at gear, gear five, Mike. <laughs> because the definitely, people. definitely. You won't go back to one. one. Yes. <laughs> definitely. Okay, great. Yeah, we have two more colleagues, uh, Joe and Tendari. Good morning, uh, Nate. <laughs> yes, Tendari. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, Okay, I'm connecting with you guys from Limpopo province, uh, a village called uh, Madurija. Don't try and uh, call it immediately. You are muted. Yes, and um, um, yeah, what do I do? <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur. Um, also, I'm also a DJ, uh, broadcast at uh, Um Yes, and then um, I'm actually also a co host again for, two, for other two shows the sports development show and um, my show is uh, tourism, hospitality, tourism, arts, and culture. And, and yeah, the weather outside is a bit chilly, cold, a bit cold, but yeah, I think um, it's not going to be a whole day um, weather because it's a bit shiny. And uh, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to today's um, lecture with the Boniway. Uh, you know, when we hear about uh, public um, relation and communication, it was always you know, something that you just hear from officers and you don't really know what you always said to get a document or to take a document and you basically don't understand what is, you know, the department is doing. But uh, as an entrepreneur, you learn that uh, those are traditions that you really need um, to understand. And today is a great opportunity for you to learn more about it. And uh, yeah, to use it as well. Everything you grab, you use it as uh, part of building yourself you know, and uh, increasing the capacity of whatever that you're doing. Um, mind, body, and spirit. Um, I'm just not in a good state. I was not well for a couple of days, so I'm still trying to recover, but I know I'm heading to the right direction. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Tantani. We hope uh, as time goes, uh, our energy will bring contribute to your, to your energy basket today. So? Uh, morning, everyone. Morning, Joe. Morning. Well, Thanks, Mr. Tim. I think you and I and Jine, we had some, we shared some wonderful sentiments this morning. As I've already indicated, I'm an early bed. I was early as 4 a.m. for my road run. I'm a regular road runner. In addition to that, I also play tennis and I watch a lot of tennis. Uh, I believe as sports and education, they go hand in hand. And road run keeps road me run going. Keeps me it keeps me healthy. It sharpens my brain. What I do in life, well, I'm an ex-banker. I used to be a business manager. Prior to that, I was a relationship manager, employer, <coughs> FS National Bank. In the year 2016, I took early retirement from the bank to put more energy in my business school. I facilitate in the following fields, business English, financial management, human resource management, power of public speaking, public finance management act, municipal finance management act, monitoring and evaluation, skills development facilitation, asset management, diversity management, and sales and service management and others. Uh, for the past four years, I trained a senior manager can you hear me? 
Yes, yes, we are with you. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, for the past four years, I trained senior management from the following departments, a national treasury, South African Defense Force, South African Police Services, Municipal Managers, Department of Human Settlement, Metro Police Department and Government Facilitators. Uh, from my intellectual perspective, I believe there is a death of mentorship and coaching in the country. I strive to uphold a high standard of quality, not only in my education, but also in my review of my participants. My aim is that my present and future participants will always be satisfied with the professional services I provide. I'm a compulsive learner with an insatiable appetite for knowledge. For me, studying is lifelong. I call it my intellectual vocation. The learning curve, it never ends. What I believe in, being a member of Cometa really, just not to be a participant, Uh, we are losing you, Joe, uh, if you can hear us. Uh, I don't know what's going on. Okay. It looks like we lost we lost connection with Joe. Okay. Um, all right. You, you will come back. I was enjoying the... The, the sharing there, I'm sure we will give him chance to to, to finish when he yeah. comes back or whenever we have uh, another time in between. Yeah, so but anyway, I I I I I know your profile, but I'm not going to be the one that is going to 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 share it with the colleagues here. I'm sure that is part of your presentation. But I also would like us to, to be allowed to interact with you as you share with us your journey so that it becomes uh, interactive and it enriches your story. I hope you are, I hope you are comfortable with that. I'm comfortable, I'm happy, no problem. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's go for it uh, uh, and, 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 and hear your story. And we are here to to engage with you. We look forward to a powerful uh, conversation. I I, I I would like it to be a conversation. And then hold away, the whole time. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So thank you so much. I think first of all, I need to say thank you to you, Sam, for, uh, for the invitation uh, and for being here, and for everybody waking up in the middle of the night in the morning to be here. It's really much appreciated. And I'm looking forward to uh, to the engagement. So maybe a bit of background on, on myself before we get into the into the professional side. I did share earlier, but um, I am born and bred. I normally say in in Gauteng. I'm from uh, an area called Sibogeng uh, in the Val Triangle. Uh, the closest town to here it's uh, it's Firenaching. Uh So um, I am. People often ask me if I am Kosa or Sutu because I. Speak speaks is so true and I've got a closer name. So there's always that confusion. So I often refer to myself as a mixed breed. My mom is Soto and my dad is uh, is Tosa, but obviously in an African way, one would say I am uh, I am Tosa. So I'm from a family. I'm from quite a big family. I've got five siblings. So um, we together uh, in total we are six. Uh, I'm the fifth of the six, and um, there's five girls and one boy. Uh, Deeply rooted in uh, in the in the Christianity belief. Um, that's how we grew up at home, and I think that has actually been my grounding place um, in many a times in life when I come across uh, challenges. So um, just so that's just me, and then I've stayed in Houghton most of my life, rather, and then I moved to Cape Town in 2015, and then made my way back to Houghton in 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 2019. Obviously, we're always chasing better opportunities, you know, chasing um, things that you think will actually put you in good standing and help you grow and develop um, as an individual. So that's me in a nutshell. So. Uh, 
if we then talk about myself, um, the career and where I am and where it started and the transitions and the and the and the and the hills that I had to climb, you know. So initially, I actually wanted to be um, when I was in grade eleven and grade twelve. I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. So being a lawyer for me was my first, 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 first passion. And then my second uh, option to that was public relations. But without having a lot of knowledge uh, as you in uh, in school. One thing that was similar between being a lawyer and being uh, in public relations is that I was going to be able to talk. So you can see, for me, it was about talking more than anything else, you know, let alone that you have to defend people, let alone that you have to write articles. It's not about that, that I didn't know. For me, it's that public relations, you talk. Lawyer, you talk. So it was all about the person for me. What I was chasing, I was chasing, <laughs> I was chasing public speaking more than anything else. All right, but uh, ultimately, then I ended up having to ended up having to uh, to to apply and to register for a public relations uh, qualifications with uh, Val University of uh, of Technology. Wow. It was it was um, it was a three year it was a three year national uh, three year national diploma, which required one to also earn uh, practical experience, which they call work integrated uh, learning. For you to be able to to graduate, so uh, I think my my my, my learning journey at, at at university or at tertiary was actually quite uh, an interesting one. I actually loved the people that I came across. I loved the the lecturers that also that I also encountered and built relationships with during my three year of of study. And I must say that um, uh, some of my senior lecturers are still I I still consider them my lecturers today. I still have a good relationship with them. I still reach out to them even today, though I'm actually outside of the of the profession. So uh, while I was still studying there, my favorite uh, yeah. my favorite uh, subject was, um, was, was 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 corporate communications. That was my main subject that I actually loved because it allowed me to um, it allowed me to speak up in class. Uh, it afforded me the opportunity to be able to write. Uh, so I think from a communications uh, point of view, I actually loved that. I loved media studies as well. There's an element of journalism. So how do you write an article? What do you consider? I learned the principles of the five W's and an H in terms of how you actually write uh, an article. And I just never forget those. If I'm bound to write, I'm just like, there's five W's and an H, the why, the why, the how, the why, and all of those. So um, I still I still apply that in my in my in my life today, and I still kept that textbook. I'm sure there's been many editions after that, but I just kept the textbook for reference purposes as well. So and then shortly after that, I had then I joined um, a manufacturing industry where I got an opportunity to do my in service training, where I get to take my theory, apply it into a practical environment, and then go back and graduate. And then I didn't get my I didn't get my in-service training immediately uh, at the beginning of my third year. I think I only got it on the third quarter of, of the year. So for the first six, 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 seven months, I was just doing my doing my studies at work, I mean, at school, and obviously not, uh, not working. Then I got my opportunity to work. And then fortunately for me, and it was a beautiful opportunity because as much as it was in manufacturing, because when you think in public relations, you're thinking the media, you're thinking uh, broadcasting, like you're thinking something that's just going to put you out there and obviously manufacturing it's nothing with uh with glamour as people assume which is assume that public relations is about glamour and i will get to the myths around public relations later so i was in a position whereby i um i worked in in corporate affairs or corporate communications and then it also then afforded me the opportunity to work closely with the internal comms manager uh who actually also then I uh, was so passionate about writing and she gave me the opportunity to write, which is something that I really liked. So I used to write articles for internal publications, newsletters and notices and speeches for management when there were when there were when there when there were events. So I was more in my element at that point versus um, other people that were also into probably into in, into events. And then I think from there, I actually worked in that space for only a year, slightly just over a year. And then I graduated. But during that time, there was an opportunity at work. Um, they had advertised a position of a public relation, no, a position of a human resources assistant. 
They advertised the position. I didn't apply. I'm not a human resources person. I didn't study human resources because we always have the belief that your profession needs to be in line with what you studied. I think George, George said that earlier. And it's, often, and it's often not the case. And it's often not the case. One thing that I have learned about studying or about any qualification is that its main purpose is to help you think and to stretch your mind and to stretch your, your horizon and the view of the world. And it's also an indication that you can put your mind to, you can, you can do anything that you put your mind to, if I may put it like that. So we must never make a mistake of believing that what you studied is what you are confined uh, within. It's just only a small element of things that you can do, but you can actually do anything that you put your mind to. It. I'm sure we, I'm sure I can transition into an engineer, you know, but anywho, science is another subject on its own. <laughs> so, so for me, I think, so I, then there was a position apply, uh, advertised for a human resources assistant. I didn't apply for it. I had no reason to. I was, I think I was in my, in my early 20s. And I didn't apply. I didn't and then I think then they didn't get a suitable candidate at that point. I don't know. About the then manager said to me that interviewed close to 15 people and they didn't get anyone. So I just got approached sitting at work. I think it was Monday morning. If Monday morning, I was sitting, I was working, I was manning the reception at that time. So our switch bot and the reception also reported under the public relations um, department. So I was sitting there, manning reception, minding my business. And then they and this lady came and said to me, you know, uh, there's a position for a human resources assistant and you didn't apply. Why? And I'm like, no, I'm in PR and I'm actually want to actually grow into the space. And then he said, uh, we didn't find a suitable candidate. Do you mind if we interview you? Okay. I don't know what that means then. And then then I went to the interview. Like it was the same day. Like she told me like two hours later. And you know the misconception, like with any other with any other profession, you're thinking human resources, you're thinking you hire and fire, you know, with a little bit of knowledge that I had at that point. That's what you know, like HR, you hire and you fire, and then yes, you recruit, and then you discipline people, which is also another misconception about human resources. And then I went for an interview, and there was a panel of four. I, as in my young age, I felt so intimidated by all these people in front of me being interviewed for something that I didn't prepare for. And then the interview was conducted that day after, at the end of the day, then I went home. And when I got home, I think a few minutes later, and then I got a call. It was um, one of the administrators in HR and, and said, would you like to work in HR? I'm like, I will, given the opportunity. She said to me, uh, you were successful in the role. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, you know, you don't know whether to be excited or not because it's good news, but like, how am I successful in a role that I didn't apply for? How do I become successful in a role that I really didn't prepare for in the in the interview? And you start wondering, what exactly did I say? You start thinking of your answers, but your answers are like, you, you're so blank, right? But when I think in my, uh, as, as time went, I realized it's because me being in public relations and uh, me being in corporate communications, um, we used to work very closely with the trade unions in my space. So with the trade unions, uh, when we're doing like when we're doing uh, initiatives or when we're doing uh, like uh, activities, when we're doing um, wellness initiatives and all of those, so I got to learn about the trade unions at that point in time. And obviously, oh, then there's a NUMSA, oh, there's a UASA, and then there's a solidarity. So the curiosity, I think, somehow that I had applied had helped me in that in that interview. Then I could actually then make mention. Of the little bit of knowledge that I had at that point around um, around around unions and what my little bit of understanding was, and that's how actually I transitioned into human resources. And then in my first month or two months, as I started attending team meetings, monthly meetings, management meetings, and I could I'm like, what are these people talking about? They talk about dispute resolution. What is dispute resolution? Yes, you know, dispute is like there's differences in opinions, resolution, then you solve, you know. What is dispute resolutions? And they're talking about going to the CCMA and they're talking about the bargaining council. I'm like, what are they bargaining? And everything was just above my head in those meetings, was literally above my head because I don't have any theoretical um, understanding or grounding into this thing, you know? And I'm thinking, what is this? And then I would write down notes and I will look into the room to say, 
who looks friendlier than the other. And then during a tea break, I could ask you a question to say, what is this? You know, what is this? But it was very Chinese to me. It was very Chinese. But fortunately, um, the manager that had appointed me um, was quite a good manager. And then I had a conversation. I said, you know what? I really appreciate the opportunity, but I really don't understand what I'm here to do. And if it's possible, can I ask or apply for a company bursary where I can actually study a human resources related qualification so that I can have the theoretical knowledge of the profession while I still continue to work so I could concurrently match the two. And fortunately, then I applied for a bursary and my bursary was then approved. And then that's when I got to study my my BA in industrial psychology, you know, and I think that then helped me. And what was nice about that qualification is that I'm, I'm studying and then I'm working. So some of the things that they talk about in class, you've had them somewhere in a meeting or someone talking about when someone talks something in a meeting or at work, you know which book to go and refer to. So I think that learning journey for me was actually quite an interesting one. And I think I was saying to someone yesterday to say, if it was possible, we could work first and then study because then the studies makes meaning. But unfortunately, at the moment, the world works um, in reverse or the opposite way. And that's how I actually then um, landed in uh, landed in human resources, you know. And at that at, at certain points, I actually still wanted to go back into PR because remember PR was also one of my first passions as well. So I actually still wanted to go back, but it became every time I tried to go back, it was like difficult. You applied for jobs and you got declined because you are in human resources. But before you knew it, you five years into this thing, six years into this thing, you've got a degree into this thing. You are contemplating on your post grad into this qualification, and you realize like, oh, there's really no turning back, you know. And um, and 14 years, I've, I've been in corporate for 15 years. And in that 15 years, 14 years has been in human resources. So you can imagine that I'm immensely entrenched, you know, in it. Um, I'm going to be soon count, be counted amongst the fossils in this uh, in this profession, you know. And that has been and that has been my journey, you know. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anything that anyone would like to ask uh, before I go further in terms of the skills that I have learned from public relations and that I have actually then applied into my human resources uh, field. So maybe if I could, if there is anything that anyone would like to know or for me to probe in based on the little that I have shared so far. No, I, I just want to make a comment. I mean, you mentioned something just now, that if it was possible, we would work first and then study. I think it is possible. Uh, and and that's, that's through what you will call uh, learnerships. Or, uh, I don't know what they used to call it. Uh, I actually agree with you 100% that, that that helps you in deciding actually what's your type of career. And, and and I think I think uh, it's possible that people can finish the trip and then be exposed to the all departments and companies through a proper program, though, you know. And then from then, then they can go back and study. It, it, it is extremely very important because I also landed in the human resources not by plan. And then I've been in human resources since ever. But I studied something different. So I don't know, I don't know whether people like Michael want to compare because Michael is doing exactly what you just said. <laughs> from, from, from finishing high school, he is studying while he's working. Mike, any comment from your side on that? Just sort of to put you on the spot. But I thought when she mentioned, I thought we have a case study here. Yes, yes, it's, it's quite a way forward to start working and and go to school. It, it kind of go well together and collaborate well because when you look at the things, it's at school, it's just a matter of theoretical. And when the transition from uh, varsity, it can be varsity or any tertiary level to work environment, it's quite hard, you know, how they analyze the things, how they collaborate how they engage with one another so the best possible option is to work and study but in this case you can do it together part-time study part-time and also working so they quite go well together mm. uh, but unfortunately the the, the, uh, the culture uh, is uh, if you have mm. a son a daughter uh, you send him to varsity then yeah. he goes and works 
he, yeah. he doesn't do secondary school and he, and you say okay go and work son then no no it's the culture is is definitely the other way go but to your point uh when i did public relations i was working and and mm. i ended up actually being a corporate affairs director because i was working and so it everything made sense as i as i said but it's something that we need to get people to begin to appreciate that uh, you can actually get uh, people to work and then learn. But I think we're still a long way because we are very, very academic as a as society. Uh, uh, and I don't know how we can begin to get that as a culture, but it's, it's the best mm -hmm. way forward. I think you learn much, much better when when you are actually at, in the at the call face as they say so oh. so are you are you what do, what is going on in your mind i mean what will have happened if you relented into a pr work immediately after finishing your studies I don't know what would have happened. I think I would be working. I think I would have. I think I would be a journalist. You know, had I pursued, um, had I pursued that, I think I would be more in 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 journalist, uh, in a in a journalism space rather. Um, apologies. Um, the reason for that is because I love I love writing, right? And then I think like any other profession. Uh, it has different facets to it, you know. So it's not just public relations and public relations or HR is HR. Like under HR, you've got um, you've got talent management, you've got performance management, you've got remuneration, you've got learning and development, you've got organizational design. So there's all those facets. Same applies to public relations. So there's public relations, then there's communications, then there's media studies, then there's stakeholder management or stakeholder relations. So, so there's also different um, different uh, compartments to that as well but i think where i was yeah, at I that point in time or where i would have loved if i i think if i i was still in public relations i would either be a, a journalist or probably in 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 stakeholder in stakeholder relations the reason for those two is because i think from a journalism point of view it's the love for writing and the love for reading because there's always knowledge one thing i learned about that is that Every time that you write something, you don't just you you write because there is a thought, but for you to make your thoughts more meaningful or informed, you go and read or you go yeah you go and read you so you go and do your research and you find more information you find more content to make your thoughts uh, coherent if I may put it like that and I think that's one of the reasons that I love writing and reading because you can't love writing without reading you can't love reading you know so mm. it actually comes uh well uh well together and that's another way of continuous learning if you of continuous learning if you think about it you know uh learning is not only classroom based learning we learn through books we learn through engagements we learn through listening to others we learn through investigating um our thoughts and our our opinions and i think it is for that that i would say um i would yeah, say that I would, say would be i would be uh, a, a journalist because putting a pen on paper for me is something that i like i was saying that to george the other day he had his thoughts on our previous show he had everything typed out and he emailed it and whatever i'm like george i'm still a pen and paper girl you know my thoughts they need i need to like you'll see i always have a pen in my hand half of the time uh so i'm like i'm a pen and paper girl i love putting my um my thoughts on paper i love scratching them out i love using highlighters you know and then at the end of the day i have a messy paper and i'm like what's happening here so i would be in that uh, or alternatively, I would be in stakeholder in stakeholder relations, and I think that for me it would be because I'm um, I also feed off other people's energies as a person. So mm -hmm. I'm actually a person that's actually quite out there, uh, and then uh, being in stakeholder relations. So it means it's it's all about having to go there and engage with people. It means having to go there and uh, and seeing how you yeah. how you build, maintain and mend and mend relationships you know and i think for me that would have it would be something that i would have energized me something that i would actually then like so i would have landed more or less in in those in those um 
in those streams. And then with journalism, I'm sure it would have also led in me getting into broadcasting somehow, you know, uh, because mm-hmm. having to talk is something that I really love. I often say that talking, I think it's my, um, I think talking is my talent, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and I, my purpose, I think it's also impacting people and making a difference in people's lives and communities. And I can do that through through talking and through knowledge sharing. And I think that's where I would have been, Sam. Hmm. Now that you are in HR, <laughs> when you think of it, you also could have missed HR. How will you, if you were to reverse and you will think, and let's imagine you missed HR, you didn't get to come into HR. I would what have would have that done to you? What if do you I think never if, you, if you didn't come into HR? Or, how, 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 when you think of it, how do you feel? When I think of HR? If you think of what would have happened if you didn't come into HR. Yeah. You are enjoying I, HR now. You are very passionate about HR. Yes. So it's also so, a good thing that it has happened. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But like I said, and if I also didn't land in HR, those two streams that I I explained earlier, that's where uh, that's where I would have that's where I would have actually that's where I would have actually then been, and but I think also from a not only from a profession but also from an academic point of view, where I would have been it's that I would have uh, chances I would have actually pursued my studies further than what I had. I would have I would have actually uh, I would have actually done my BTEC in public relations. I would have done my honors in uh, in corporate um in, in corporate in corporate communications and i think i would be at a point in time as much now as i like to contribute in terms of the hr uh, profession i would also be doing the same um contributing to the public relations uh, profession I, pr- I would probably be a member of prisa which is uh, which is a professional body for for public relations which i would also advise people that are in that in that in that space to also probably get their membership with prisa as well because you know we always need those professional bodies that ground us uh, those professional bodies you know that actually uh, teach us to that actually then also teach us and inform us around the best practices as well because like any other profession public relations is a is it is a respected profession and had i stayed in there it would be how do i actually then contribute in that space and how do i share my knowledge with others how do i share my knowledge with up, upcoming individuals and how do i make sure that the profession has the right level of respect in the in the industry like any other career and i think those are some of the things that i would have been working on if i think about it now mm. so yeah i think that's that from that from that perspective before i continue i just i just had a, a small question tinda i mean uh but anyway you said that um you were in manufacturing at one point yes, in the industry, are you still in manufacturing today? No, no, I'm not. Um, I am in financial services at the moment. Uh, okay. insur- in, in, in insurance, I've been in financial services for, for six years now. I think in manufacturing, I spent close to five years, one close to five years at that same company. My first year being in public relations and communications and the four years being in, um, in in human resources. So I don't miss those days of having to wear PPE, those boots, oh, those yeah. hard heads, yeah, yeah. Driving, at, driving at 60 and the pollution and everything else. But it was actually quite a nice environment because I think that's where my love also for um, for labor relations into HR actually stems from, or my knowledge stems from, because you learn from the best. So now I'm in financial, serv- I'm in financial services. Okay, great, thank you. Great. George, what are you thinking? I see you leaning your head against the wall. What are your thoughts? <laughs> no, I, I, I went into the beverage business, into my proper, proper manufacturing. And um, we made alcohol beer and Coca-Cola and all that. And uh, in the, whenever you had to do take journalists out and all that, it's the same thing. I lived uh, overalls, uh, cab, hard hats, and uh, walk around there and uh, they always wondered but you dressed in a suit how do you <laughs> but the point was when you are in that en- environment it, it, what does it teach you it teaches you discipline in terms of why you put on the hard hat why you put on that ppe 
in fact we actually did a an article on on on, on television around that as to why you need to put that on because if you don't then these are the consequences etc etc so i was just laughing about uh, about that yes yeah. it's about it's about safety first hey i think one thing that you learn in in manufacturing it's it's safety more than anything it is so strange that even today when i reverse my car i always say i have my i have my my safety belt on which is not normal you know but because at that point your safety was so important if you were found without a safety belt you would get a warning you would get to park outside and have to walk into the into the plant and all of that so i always i always have my safety belt on meaning even when i reverse i have that and it's it's one of the disciplines of safety is one of the disciplines that one actually learns in uh, in manufacturing so yeah i think that's that like in terms of where uh in terms of where i have or what my journey has actually uh, has actually then and, and then been colleagues but then maybe now let's actually then uh, um get into what are those skills that um i actually have learned from a public relations perspective which i think they remain relevant me having transitioned into human resources and also um and i think it's the skills that will not only be applicable in human resources but they will be applicable in life generally and they will be applicable in any other in any other professional you know whether it's it's a technical profession and all of those you would actually uh learn those skills and they will actually come in handy and i think for me the most important one which was actually cemented in my in my studies and in public relations and also in my in my one year of profession in that space was actually communication communication i think it's the most important skill that each person must 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 invest in and it's a skill that one must work on um on developing it continuously because communication is also about how you show up as a as a person right and we often talk about verbal communication and we also talk about nonverbal communication one of the things is that as much as you might not be talking but how you show up your facial expression many people can yeah. read uh, can read a lot in can read a lot into it right and it might not be how you feeling or what you thinking but how you show up it's actually quite uh, quite important verbal communication is so 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 important and when we're talking about verbal communication right. we're not really talking about being an extrovert it's not about that it's not being about an extrovert or or anything else but it's about being in a position of knowing how to express yourself knowing how to express your thoughts knowing how to be able to engage with people respectfully and engage meaningfully and to uh, to my earlier point about communication it's about the the amount of information that you have the reading the, the reading that you do the writing that you do the information that you gather from any other from any other sources and i think for me that has actually been quite uh, quite important for me because it has enabled me to be able to express myself it has enabled me to be to have the confidence you know as much as sometimes you can be in a room full of people of high profile where you feel intimidated where you are not sure if you should be in that room but the fact that you are able to raise a hand and express yourself or you are able to raise your hand and ask a clarity seeking question i think it goes a long way and that actually helps in terms of your brand it also helps in terms of your in terms of visibility and another thing is about when you communicate it's not only about having to communicate but it's about how you actually package that message or that that message that you're putting uh, forward because sometimes you can have good thoughts and ideas but they could be fragmented they could be all over the show but one thing about communication is that it helps you narrow down your message to get to the key point um quite uh quite quickly right and i think for me it's one of those things that i've actually learned when i was actually in the public relations field as a as a as a profession like i said i used to actually write internal articles so it's about how you write your message how you how you write your message and who are you writing it to who are your target audience you know is your message meant for everyone is your message meant for a specific uh group of people how do you package that and i think that has helped me quite a quite a lot in even in my human resources field to say when i go talk 
to people or when I'm facilitating, for example, if I'm facilitating a session and it's for employees only, how do I show up and how do I put my message across? If I'm facilitating a session and it's only for management, how do I, how does that come across? And if I'm facilitating um, a session and it's both employees and management, how do I then come across? And those are some of the skills that you actually then learn in PR to say, how do you distinguish between um your stakeholders how do you distinguish between the, your the recipients of your message and if you've got different people how do you make sure that at the end of your of your session you've managed to touch each and every person with their different needs and their different um uh their different personas so i think for me communication has actually been in in, in has, has actually um been one of those key key skills and learning that i have taken from my pr world still continuing to apply uh into my into my into my human resources world and i say if you, you need to know how to express yourself especially when you're in corporate guys sometimes you can know how to work hard you can you can you can be a hard worker you can deliver you can know all the technical aspects to 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 your job but if you're unable to share those if you're unable to express what you've been doing that could to a certain extent be a disadvantage and that's why communication for me in this list actually comes on top of um, on top of the list mm. right i see you nodding sam yeah yeah i'm thinking as you are sharing these uh, insights how many of us have not advanced in our profession simply because of not being aware of these points you are raising, uh, especially in areas like human resources, you know, because you spend the entire day in the human resources function communicating basically. So, so, so have you ever found yourself in a situation where you see this person wants to communicate something, but they are let down by their lack of awareness of the signs on the art of communication? You do, you do quite a lot. Sometimes you, and I'll maybe take it back to maybe having to facilitate. Sometimes you, um, you facilitate a session and then you can see that people are in, like they are deep in thought in terms of the conversations, in terms of what's happening. But not everybody um, is comfortable to speak up. Not everybody is comfortable to ask a question or raise a hand or participate. And I think it's important for you as a facilitator to be able to read the room, to be able to, to read the people that you're actually facilitating for and find ways of bringing people closer to you in terms of having to, 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 to open up. Sometimes you can just go ahead and call someone and say, if you were in this situation, what would you do? You know, that in that way, you get a person then to share their experiences without actually putting them on the spot, you know. And by that, then they actually get to open up and share, which is something they wouldn't have voluntarily done. They wouldn't have voluntarily put up their hand or voluntarily just open their mouth and 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 and, and speak. And I think that's one thing that is important when you're actually facilitating. Read your room, understand your audience, and be able to reach out to people. And just by observing, like I said, just by observing their their nonverbal they are non-verbal gestures, you know. If you see someone nodding, and say, oh, like I just did with you right now, Sam, I said, Sam, you're nodding, you know. So you're nodding to something. Tell us what you're nodding to, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and sometimes that actually quite uh, quite helps. But if you stand in a room, go in to facilitate a session, and you're the only person that's then doing, um, that's, that's doing the talking, and then you don't afford anyone an opportunity to talk, then you don't, you don't, you're not, so you end up not being sure as you, uh, for yourself to say, was this meaningful or not? Did it land where it was supposed to land and how it was supposed to land? And the only way that you can actually be able to measure that, you can, me you can measure that through, through communication, through engagement, and through creating a platform that makes it easier for people to... Um, for people to share and sometimes if it's one of those that people cannot raise up their hands or you cannot call them out you know you use sticky notes for people to write down their ideas and you get people to exchange that and actually say if you were the one reading this if you were the one that wrote this what would that mean to you and stuff like that so it's 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 it's, it's a skill that you that i don't want to call it an art but it's a skill that you need to that you always need to learn and continue to craft um to craft every time so yeah i think for me that's quite key uh i want to support you 200 percent on that 
because what they say is that sometimes it's not the thought or the idea that should be tabled to the board to uh, recipients it's because the idea is okay but it's the way it is put if one guy goes to them with that same idea and engages in a say an aggressive manner etc it will be rejected that idea but if you know how to communicate it you get everyone giving you a standing ovation but it's the same message and so how you do it the words you use with the email how do you do that and when you get the art of doing that uh you, mm. you, you you are there so it's it's such an important aspect what she's talking about it's very very important mm. Mm. you mentioned that there were a couple of skills that uh, you picked up from uh, uh anyway, you picked up from your pr that are applicable now to your human resources. You mentioned communication, and I was waiting for the others. Is you disconnected? I think she's frozen for a second. Yes. I think she makes such a good point in, um, in what she's talking about with being able to communicate and understand the stakeholders and different audiences and to, to be able to read the, the room and pick up on energy. All of that is so important in communication. I feel like she's making great points that um, mm -hmm. that I'm writing down. And it's nice to hear that reiterated too, you know, just to, mm -hmm. to realize that that's important for you to do that. And when she talked about, um, you know, if you come across someone where there's no connection and you're the only one speaking and then you're not hearing anything reciprocated and you're talking to a group to maybe uh, reach in or tap into someone else and be, and be able to ask, like, what would you do if you were in this position? She makes some really great points. And you're back, by the way. <laughs> and I'm back. <laughs> mm. and I'm back. You know, you know uh, you're making me think of how we relate to this topic and how we think about it. So, so it looks like it is almost a chapter of every profession where you deal with people. Mm. And therefore it should actually be mandatory for any profession where you are going to deal with people, whether you are, a, a, especially in the, in, the, in the assistance professions, whether you are a nurse or you are a policeman or you are a teacher, Wherever there is communication, it looks like this is something that needs to be embedded in all qualifications. Will you agree? And then I was asking, you said communications is one of the skills that stand out from all the skills you acquired from PR that you are using now in your current profession. I'm, I'm interested to hear many other skills that you picked up from PR. Uh, uh, qualifications that you are applying today in your day-to-day -day professional life. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Sam. Uh, so yes, I think communication, like it's it's important in every profession. You know, whether it's an art day or whether you are in a lab or whatever, you still need to engage with people at at a, at a certain point in time, and it's about how your message lands as well. I think the second one uh, or the other one, now I'm just, they are, now they're not in order. Communication had to be out there, and, but for the others, they're just not in order. So Can me, I, I interrupt that's... again? And, uh, I'll tell you, what, in my other life, uh, we do counseling, me and my wife. We, we, we counsel a uh, couple. And the biggest, one of the biggest factors for divorces and missing it is just a failure to communicate. And you will find that the guys who master communication as a couple will, I don't say live happily ever after, but they get to understand and work together better. Most times, the reason why there's, there's so much strain is because couples can't communicate properly. And so you talk about body language, you talk about tone, you talk about the words you use, how you use them, when you use them. That is so critical that 
in any relationship, whether it's a business relationship, uh, uh, marriage, it is such a paramount thing. And therefore, the point that you make, how else can we get people to understand this? How can we train people? On its own, it's actually a big field that needs attention. So 100% agree there, 200%. Two hundred percent. Thanks, uh, thanks for that, uh, George. And like you are, you are, you are spot on. We could have a conversation around communication for the entire day. So, um, so the second, um, the second um, skill for me that is actually quite important that I have also learned that one needs to le- that I learned from uh, from from my PR world and applying also in HR or is relevant or it's prevalent as well as adaptability. What do I mean by adaptability? And I will actually use or use the um, what is this the 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 COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. The COVID nineteen pandemic has taken us out of our comfort zones as individuals uh, and as families, as 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 professionals, uh, companies, and all of those things. You know, uh, what used to be a norm is not a norm anymore. Things that we thought could take long to be done and implemented are now done overnight. Uh, you know, uh, having to understand and adjust, uh, you know, to a way of living in terms of I need to limit my social interactions. I need to mask uh, every time that I go out. I need to sanitize. If I go out, I need to make sure that I wash my hands regularly. Previously, you would wash your hands as a norm, but now, you know, you know I need to, like, make sure that every time I wash my hands, I wash my hands with soap, and I wash them for a minimum of 20 seconds, you know. At the beginning, I'm sure we used to count one, two, you know, and whatever, but eventually 20 seconds become entrenched somehow in how you wash your hands, and I think adaptability is quite important. So from a public relations world, one of the things is actually about adaptability because we know public public relations, how it uses, how it normally deals with company uh, probably images or they actually manage um, or they actually manage how they manage stake, I'm sorry, crisis management, right? And when a crisis erupts, you know, uh, it's not about I still need to do one, two, three, four up until 10 before I fix this thing. When there is, a, when a brand is in crisis, when your reputation is in crisis, you need to think on your feet and act on your feet and act fast. And that is one mm-hmm. of the things that are quite important in public relations. But as much as you might need to think on your feet and you might need to actually act fast, obviously you work fast within the boundaries of the of the ethos of the profession uh, and all of those things, but you have to salvage yourself. You have to salvage you have that. To salvage that. that. You have to salvage that um, that image as well, and it's not about uh, how long, but it's about immediately. And you need to adapt to that. You need to be able to reach out to people quickly. You need to be in a position of having to make decisions quickly. And I'll use one simple example. One of the things that I learned when I was at school about public relations to say everything that you do, you must always have a plan B. If you're planning on having a a, a garden event, and mm all planned your, your your suppliers are on board you everything is proper you need to have a plan b to say if on that particular day it rains come what may that invent that um that function still needs to continue so it teaches you to have a plan b and by that teaches teaching you to have a plan b it say you always need to have options in what you do you know, to say it could go either way, you know, it might not go as I want it, but I need to be in a position to adapt myself to the circumstances and to the environment. But ultimately, I'll be able to 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 get to my ultimate to my ultimate goal. And I think um, for me, adaptability, not being comfortable in what you are now, not being comfortable in how things are done. And it also then co- also talks to about the concept of continuous improvement. So what you know today <laughs> might not be relevant tomorrow. And if you look at it from a human resources perspective, what you find that is that, um, George, you would know that from, our, that from the show that you and I normally host is that what happens is that, um, what happens is that we talk about how human resources has evolved over the years, how it has re- evolved in the past 12 months Due to the due to the pandemic due to the pandemic, how organizations had to beef up their wellness offering, how IT has to beef up their IT offering. Where at some point we were told that we cannot work from home, 
working from home was something that was just done within a, a matter of, of weeks and days, you know. So I think that adaptability, I actually also learned there to say what is, what is today might not be tomorrow. And you need to be comfortable in knowing that things are not always the same. Things are always shifting. Things are always moving. But you need to actually then work on yourself to be able to be adaptable. We're talking about... Um, the vocal world, you know, the volatility and all of those, the uncertainties that we actually then uh, deal with. But PR, it's built around that. PR, it's built around uncertainty. It's a, it's about that. You know, you never know what, what, what they think of you today might not be of what they think of you tomorrow. So it actually teaches you to, you need to be, you need to think on your feet. You need to be able to adapt to what the market or what the industry is actually looking for. And you must make sure that in the midst of that, you get to maintain your brand, you get to maintain your reputation, and you are able to redeem yourself confidently so as a, as a brand. And I think that I have seen that happening in human resources in the, in, in, in the past and even now, whereby we actually have to change the way that we're thinking. It's not only about processes, it's not only about governance, it's not only about compliance, it's not only about pushing papers, you know, but it's about how you then adapt to the new way, to the new ways of working, how you adapt to the changing world, how you adapt uh, given uh, given sight of the of the global of the global trends and all of those things. So adaptability is also one thing that you find quite a lot in public relations, but we actually I have seen it in myself and in my career, how I actually then had to how I actually had to adapt. You know, we're talking about, for example, what's prominent right now. We talk, we see what's happening in the world around the COVID-19, the loss of jobs, uh, like retrenchments that are happening. We need to adapt to that. How do you support the process? How do you make sure that people then uh, get to understand? You actually have a job, but you, you know that in the next two months or three months, your job might not be there. How do you get yourself ready to prepare for to prepare for the for the unknown or to prepare for the to prepare for the worst? So adaptability is one skill that I would actually say, you know, um, I have learned during my PR days and then it's still even today, I need to be adaptable at any given point in time because I never know what uh, what tomorrow holds and legislation changes. Uh, introduction of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, you know, the world that we really we live in at, at right now, you actually need to be adaptable and be open to new learnings at all times. Cool. Um, any thoughts on that, colleagues? Anyone who wants to engage me on that or thinking? Hmm. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I want to know, when you say you need to have plan B, I mean, it looks like that is a standard in PR. That, that there must be plan B, but as a behavior, uh, what do you recommend one should build that in? You know, it's almost like, is it, is it enough to just to say things might go wrong? And if they go wrong, I need to look for some alternative. Or are you saying that there needs to be a practice? If I have a plan to host an event, I must have a parallel plan in case anything that I plan doesn't happen. Yeah. So, is it a, you're looking at it as a behavior, or you look at it as a, as, as almost like a standard operation guideline that you must have Plan B, <laughs> or you just say just be aware that this might just not work. Well. I think for me it should be a standard. You must always have a Plan B, and maybe you can actually work around your Plan B. For example, in PR, you can work around your Plan B with the same suppliers that you have. So not to complicate your, 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 your life on that particular day. So it should be a standard to say, what if, you know, you need to have the what if, in, in you need to have the what if in mind. So you actually have to have that because you can, you, you can never guarantee anything with nature, you know? So things can go either way, but at the end of the day, remember, you need to remember what is the end goal. And that's the one thing that you have, you need to have in mind. What is your end goal? And you need to say, my I will achieve my end goal irrespective of the circumstances, right? So it is a, for me, it, it, it is a standard that you have to have. But when you're coming from a behavioral point of view that you raise, which is actually quite key, adaptability also comes with mental with mental strength as well, you know, because um, it comes with mental strength. Because if you if it finds you at a point in time where you are not mentally strong. 
you might not be able to bounce back or you might not be able to bounce back or be able to redeem mm -hmm. yourself of the mishap that um, that is happening in front of you at that point in time. So mental strength becomes quite important and also resilience as well. From, some, from a behavioral point of view, there's an element of resilience, you know, because remember when you're talking about resilience, we're talking about the ability to be able to bounce back. You know, so you need to be able, you need to be in a position to be able to bounce back, to bounce back to say, yes, it is difficult. Yes, things are not going the way that I want. I'm not going to achieve what I wanted to achieve within um, the desired constraints and everything else. But it's about how do you actually then bounce back and then resilience then becomes that important behavior that one needs to uh, to 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 invest in and to to work in as well to say a setback it does not mean i'm not going to get to my own goal a setback means i need to relook but i need to be strong enough to be able to bounce back so that i can actually be able to overcome the mishap to actually get to my ultimate goal so i think from a behavioral point of view it's uh, adaptability goes quite well with uh, resilience but like i said in terms of your execution and your delivery you need to make it a, a standard to say if plan A does not work, plan B must be somewhere close that um, to be able to, to step in. And maybe plan B might not work as exceptionally when there's your plan A. And maybe there might have to be major adjustments in terms of timelines, in terms of what you want. But it must just be there so that ultimately you are able to achieve what you had initially put your mind to. That's that's great. Bonnie Way, can I, can I ask you? Um, when you're talking about crisis management, and this may be covered in your materials later, but um, when you talk about crisis management and you have to be resilient and be quick to respond to what's going on, does one, how, how, how do you suggest one gets a message across quickly and clearly to all who are stakeholders or to all of the people who need to go into operation? How do you, how do you, when, when people have different ways of receiving information, you know, there's mm -hmm. different filters, people hear things differently or they interpret things differently. You need it to be really clear. Um, and in a crisis, it needs to be quick and concise. So I, I don't know if that's in your materials later, but how would you suggest one um, finds themselves to navigate all the different styles of receiving the information in? Yeah. So one of the things that I was actually going to cover, uh, I was going to cover on, it was around uh, around stakeholder management. All right. So when you're talking about stakeholder management, we know we're talking about building relationships and maintaining relationships. And in your building relationships and maintaining relationships um, also talks to um, understanding each and every stakeholder that you have and understanding that uh, you might have a you might have a, a blueprint in terms of how you manage your relationships or your stakeholders but what you learn in PR is that you need to understand your stakeholders differently to say what what works with Sam and what works with George and what works with Janae and Michael and all of those as, as they are different stakeholders and they they have, they contribute to me differently how I manage my relationships with them it's not a one size fit all type of approach and in you building and maintaining that relationship you would have established to say what works for company a what works for company b what works for company c and how do we communicate on a regular basis you know is our communication hierarchical is our communication open uh, is our channels of communication always um formalized to emails formalized to face-to-face -face meetings uh, can we actually then communicate via instant messages and all that? One of the things that you need to understand very clearly is you, you will have your own stakeholder management plan that you utilize as your blueprint. But over and above that, you need to understand your stakeholders differently and what appeals to one might not appeal to, to any. So at the time that you find yourself in that crisis, in that crisis mode where you actually need to um, <clears throat> inform your stakeholders or your your stakeholders in terms of what is happening and what is expected or how the crisis is going to impact them you're not going to send email to all five of them because one person might not be, might be bad with emails another person might be held up in other commitments and they will see your emails either late in the evening and then other people will see it immediately because if you they see your name everything just stops and then they actually get to look but you need to be in a position in a crisis management you need to be in a position of actually understanding 
who are the impacted people by this crisis and how have how are your relationships managed in that um I, 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 your relationships are managed and maintained and in doing that you also need to understand that you're not only going to be able to do that on your own uh, as a, um as a, as as a, as a public relations practitioner or as a human resources uh, practitioner but it's about what are the, what are the other links that you use to be able to get the message across. You do it yourself, you do it through other people, you do it via uh, various modes of uh, of communication. So that is not a one size fits all, but I think if you then understand who your stakeholders are and you understand what is your own unique value proposition that you have given to those people that you have built, and then you understand the formality and the informality of your relationship, then that can actually allow you or put you in good standing in terms of putting the message across quickly. The mistake that uh, professionals should not make it's assuming that what works for Boniwe works for Sam or works for Michael. And that is not the case. Boniwe can just send a WhatsApp very quickly. She will read it and she'll understand and she'll know where to go. And if she can't get hold of me, then she knows that I actually need to call to call Tendai to be able to get more detail. But with Michael, I know Michael sometimes is a difficult client. I personally need to call Michael and say, Michael, this is the situation and I need to actually bring you up to speed. And then you actually leverage of the different pillars to be able to put the message across. But making sure that you are clear and your stakeholders are clear and your dependencies and the people that work with you are clear in terms of how, this is what we're lending, this is the crisis that we're solving, and this is how we're going to go about it. But you need to actually be uh, multifaceted in terms of how you approach it. It will not be the same for it will not be the same for everyone. And that's why one of the one it was my other point to say, understand who your stakeholders are, what their needs are, what what is what is the basis and the foundation of your relationship and what their needs are and what is your value to them and what is their value to you. What is the return on investment on both relationships? And that really helps you when it comes to crisis management to say, even if it's a bad publicity, but you, your state, the relationship that you have with your stakeholders and them knowing what you're capable of, you know, will help you in good standing in, term, in terms of redeeming yourself as a, as a profession or as an organization. Thank you for that. Great. Welcome, thank you. Uh, Sydney. Hi, uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, 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 thank you so much for, for coming in. Uh, I'm enjoying the discussion. Uh, immediately I come in. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, I had something uh, that came in this morning. No problem. No yeah, problem. Um, sure. Any other comments, colleagues? Uh, you still have some more? Yeah. In, yeah, I suppose when you're making your plans, um, this thing about plan B at all times, uh, even when you guys sleep. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sure. Now, the plan B there would be to mute him uh, from your side, but <laughs> the, when you when you, when you're making strategic plans, you you would always have a plan B. So this is our target for this year. Da, da, da. What if we don't do it? Then our plan B is this is how we would execute. We always hope that you don't use your plan B. <laughs> you always hope you don't ever use your plan B, but you must have it. As a must, so just to, to confirm that you really do need it as a standard. Uh, don't 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 work on hope. Work on understanding that things will go wrong, can go wrong. If they don't go wrong, well, nobody will ever know Plan B. But if they do yeah. go wrong, people won't won't even know that there is a crisis. Because mm. of things seems normal. <laughs> and and let me make a typical example from a uh, from uh, from a human resources side, right? If, for example, you have a case that's going to the CCMA, to the um, Commission of Conciliation and Mediation, uh, what happens is, um, and mediation and arbitration, sorry. So what happens is that when you go there, well, your first time, maybe when the case is being referred to the CCMA and it sits for, 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 for conciliation, remember, conciliation is about how do we find a common ground to actually then resolve this, you know, without us having to go to arbitrate or litigate um, the issue, right? And then, but one of the things that we do or when you even go to arbitration, it's that you actually get a mandate from your seniors or from the line manager or from whoever the powers that be to say, you know what, I, I will go and arbitrate this matter, 
I think we have a high chance of us winning this case. I think we have our tracks covered and we've done all that is that is right and fair. However, can I get a mandate that should for any reason the ruling be against us? Can I get a mandate to say, can I have a three months or a six month settlement, uh, you know, uh, approved so that we can be able to settle the matter and pay the, the individual that's aggrieved by the matter, you know? So no one knows that you have a mandate many a times. You're not going to get there and say, okay, guys, let's conciliate, but I do have a, a, a six months uh, approval for me to give you <laughs> like a, a six months payout. No, we will conciliate that matter up until we find any other resolution than paying you out. You get what I mean? So you go prepared so that if you find yourself sitting there and the commissioner says, you, we, we need to make a, we need to make a call or probably we need to, like, you need to pay this person. You don't have to say, oh, commissioner, wait. Let me call the office and ask. And then when I ask my boss, my boss is in a meeting, my boss, my boss's boss is in a meeting, and everybody that has to make a call is 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 it's busy somewhere because everybody's busy, right? But as for you, as a as a matter of being proactive and as a matter of planning ahead to make sure that when you are there, you actually have the right approvals in place, you also you actually have the right mandates in place, then you do, then you actually do that. And that is your plan B. You actually go there with the intention of having to, to settle the matter or to win the matter, you know? But for whatever reason, things can take a, can take a different direction. And when it, when it does, and you actually need to make a certain call, you've already engaged with your, with your, with your powers that be to say, this, is, this could happen and this is what I need. And you already have that and you can really settle at that point in time. So that's another example of a plan B from mm. a human resources uh, point of view, George. Really good. Mm. Uh, I think we are achieving what we wanted to address, and that is make it simple and understandable that that this 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 is something that is integral to our relationships with our stakeholders. And and I'm sitting here and asking myself, this is a function that is easily can easily be taken off the table because it's not cheap. You know, to hire a full-time communication specialist in the company. And yet, when you are in trouble, you need it. People that see your value. Yeah. Actually, for me, it's like an, having an insurance. You know, to know that if we are in trouble with a specialist, that will actually package the messaging so well that there's not too much damage being done. That is part of it. Um, that is part of it, uh, Sam, you know. And one of the things that I will touch on later, probably in the afternoon, as we also continue the conversation, like I said earlier, is to talk about the myths of um, of public relations as a as a profession. You know, some of the people they look at it as, as like as a glamorous profession, uh, you know, as a one of the things that I never liked to hear around it, it's that public relations professionals are spin doctors, you know. But we can actually talk about that later in the afternoon and what it means not now, you know, because there is value in the profession on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, in terms of, of the of the maintenance, the sustainability, uh, you know, of the of, of the organization and the value that it uh, that it brings. Because remember, it's also not a profession that only shows up when there is a crisis, you know. It shows up mm -hmm. when there isn't a crisis. It shows up when there is uh, when there is strategic uh, when there is strategic conversations to be had in the organizations with whether with stakeholders, whether with uh, with employees. There is meaningful contributions that the public relations professional bring to the table uh, every day. And this is one of the things that we will actually later on get to uh, get to discuss as well. But it is actually quite important. But to your point, Sam, that is one of their other roles. But sadly, some organizations, they only see its value when, uh, when Popo hits the fan. You know, it's only when they see it, but it's actually not that. It actually contributes meaningfully to organizations on a day-to-day -day basis. Just that some many a times they are very it's not communicated well for people to see to say this has actually been done because of this particular department or function that we have. So it's proactive and reactive in a way. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, one, you on. one of the things when you look at the history of public relations that did the most harm to the profession was that 
bosses who had no business with a retiring secretary or somebody they would say oh so what do we do with her in the next year before she goes home i'll make her a public relations person so she can talk to, to mm. and so you found people being shoved into public relations who the organization doesn't quite know what to do with. Mm. and as a result the image then that was portrayed of public relations was these guys go and have tea they 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 hire the tent and 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 ensure that the event happens whereas actually that's a tiny tiny bit of of, of public relations in fact that you can outsource you don't you don't need mm. to have somebody who has tents in your in your in the business what you need the public relations person is commercial communication uh internal communication mm. uh, stakeholder engagement that's why you need public so one of the greatest piece of harm and the, one of the things that we fought uh, around that was to change the perception of the public of what public relations is about it's a key bit of the business it's it's it's, it's an integral part of the business it's not it's not the secretary yeah. who has for me it's george it is i don't mention yeah. that <laughs> thank yeah, you Manny, no, for me george it sounds like it sounds like this is a, a, a core of our engagement with our stakeholders, with our market, with our everybody else, is actually how do you even speak to clients if you don't know what language and how you should be speaking to clients? If, if PR, so PR, that's why PR and marketing, they are actually related in my view, because the marketers go out there having been prepared by the PR or, or they having prepared the messaging. Uh, so, so it is it, 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 almost like, uh, and I think we use all these ways, and we find somebody called PR and marketing. Market uh, now, for instance, what's the difference between PR and spokesperson? It's the same. It's the same. It's perf it can be performed by the same function, but you find companies appointing a spokesperson. The, the only thing that person does is to stand on the platform and talk on behalf of the company. But I assume that that spoke, being a spokesperson is part of PR. Am I right? It is. It is. It is generally what. So they not everybody. PR. Not everybody can be a spokesperson, Kelly. So within the PR department, you would actually have George as the person who talks, uh, who is the spokesperson. But as the team prepares the messages, what do we say, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Within that, they have somebody. But as you say. Uh, you, you can actually have someone whose role is exclusive uh, to talk, depending on the organization. So, for instance, you have a political party, uh, ANC. So <laughs> because they're always in the media, they will have a spokesperson. But if pardon, you're me just, pardon me, just sorry. a second. Sam, um, is, it, is it okay for us to uh, bounce back to Bonnie Way a little bit later? Oh, okay. yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay, it's okay. Yeah, what was the question? So Bonnie Way is gonna um, rejoin us later. Oh yes, yes. Okay. Bonnie Way, you 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 want to be given time to? Sorry, I didn't see the message. Yeah. Okay, Bonnie. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, apologies, Great. I actually hadn't read the message. <laughs> uh, now I was saying that depending on the organization, some organizations are very much in in the in people's faces. So you hear the ANC spokesperson because they're always in people's faces. Then you have the guy who manufactures the overalls and what he does. And, and so he doesn't have too much interface. So it, the guy who does PR there does everything, including be the spokesperson. And the other organization will actually want a dedicated individual for that. But whoever it is, you must have that person and an alternative as the spokesperson. So if Sam is the spokesperson, we'll say then, Janae, if Sam gets hit by a bus or something, you are, mm. so that ahead of the game, everybody knows 
for who the alternative is. Mm. Yeah. Is there a value in everybody? Sorry, Tine. No, no, please. Is there a value in having every member of the team being trained on PR, even though there are those who are specialist PR people? Yes. Um, what? Let me talk from my experience. When we had our corporate affairs department, we had five people in there, and each person was was media trained. Mm. And then we trained the general managers of the individual units. Each one of them was media trained. They hated it, but uh, we, we forced them through. <laughs> oh, all I know is finance and running an operation. No, there's a day where you have to talk to the media and we don't want you to mess up the brand. So th we trained all of them. And eventually when you train them, they find it, oh, it's not, it's not as terrifying as we thought. The, 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 now we can actually do this, but you have to have that as a plan. Because if you don't, I can tell you, uh, if the media goes to that man and asks questions, by the time he's gone through uh, stammering and they try to say, look for George, the damage is done. Mm. And so, yes, plan B is an absolute essential. Mm. Mm. Wow. So, yeah. Um, it, it, there, there's it's a so big many field. Mm. It's a big field. Mm -hmm. There, there are so many companies like George, what you were, where you were just talking about, like, you know, to make sure that everybody is trained is such a great practice, especially in today's day and age where media comes from everywhere. There's a camera everywhere. You're always on, you always need to be prepared. And the, I, I would say, which is almost outdated today, it used to be that, um, you know, if you were not at a certain level in an organization or not permitted to, if you were not in PR or in mm -hmm. communications, that you would not be permitted to speak on behalf of a company. And so many companies still have that today, but um, it, it seems almost as if it could be, you know, becoming outdated because um, media has become, I mean, it's, it's still formal. There's still formal media, but there's, there's, so, there are some things that require more and more people. It's, it's, the scope is broader for people to be more public within an organization. So you no longer have to be at the executive level to um, have a role where you're publicly facing and to have people media trained at all levels is such a great practice. It used to just be the small little group and it was a gate around, you know, the small group of people who could do that. But today, I mean, I mean, you make such a great point to say um, more people should be trained because so many more people are public facing. You don't know when you're going to be put on the spot. You should be trained for it. All of us have got our cell phone, we tweet and we, we Facebook and, and you could be tweeting uh, on the company account or the fact that you work for this company. Even mm. if you tweeted using your own private account, you are mm. associated with that company. And if right. you are not sensitive and aware, uh, you might just cause a huge damage. That's true. In fact, Sam, th that point is such a powerful point that we dedicated time to, to explain it to, to employees. See, the higher you are in an organization, the more you are identified by, with your employer. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you cannot, even if you're attending a soccer game on a Sunday between Chiefs and, and, and Orlando mm -hmm. Pirates, and something happens there, you must remember that I am an employee of Cometa. That's right. And therefore, what mm. I say has the potential to harm or even enhance the brand. But you have to have mm. that understanding and knowledge. If and so an organization that doesn't tell its employees that runs the risk of, of really damaging. Because nowadays uh, the reporter is, is holding a cell phone. He's hey, say, how are you doing? That's right. So I, I've seen you from 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 Comesa. What do you think of the, the, the violence in this game? <laughs> oh, no sense. No, 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 no. Because supporters are fighting and he's asking for a comment. What do you do? And therefore, people understanding that whatever I do or say, once you are associated with Cometa, then you must know 
that whatever you do can go back to Kumeza. Right. And once you have that, yeah, it makes life much easier. But training people to do that is the big thing. So maybe you yeah. want to, this is a subject for discussion, Sam. You may want to yeah. you know, <laughs> if you and understand this because it's such a powerful, powerful point. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. you, you, uh, you, you remind me, Brother George, of uh, my, my former days when I used, still used to be a, a footballer. Um, and, and if you look at um, you know, the life of a footballer, they are praying for, for a team, but you look at the behavior of them outside of, the, of their own personal lives, um, it doesn't align with the key values of the, of the teams, you know. So, so as players, we're not trained to, you know, to behave, you know. It's like I, when I just finished, uh, uh, you know, wearing that shirt, uh, now I get into my own self now. <laughs> so it means I've got two characters, but I don't understand the impact that I, on the impact that I make. So I, I, I really, um, you know, uh, hear that, you know, we need to be able to uh, understand that we are brands uh, of the companies that we present. Mm -hmm. And our behavior are, are, are so much impactful in the way we do things. Either we are, I am a church, I'm, for example, I wear a lot of hats. I'm a pastor there, I'm a player there, um, I'm a director in my company and all of that. <laughs> but I am one but person, one you know. So, so the question that I, um, I can ask is, how do I ensure that <clears throat> despite the various roles that I have, and despite the various brands that I have, how do I remain consistent with my brand? The, 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 I think John Martini has a program where, on values, uh, some of you, what are your values, what are your top values, what are the things that you do naturally, etc. But so if we're talking about an organization, and so let's say Casey Chips, each player who comes in must understand what Casey Chips stands for. It's not just about kicking the ball. Mm. They have responsibility in society. What are those things that we should do? So that as the player uh, transitions from the 90 minutes against Swallows and goes out, now he understands that I'm still Casey Chief, but the hat is slightly different. This is, this is the integrity hat now that I'm wearing, where whatever I do doesn't harm the integrity of Chiefs. In fact, it must enhance it. So I understand that on a Sunday morning when I go to church and I speak to the children, people say, oh, that's Sydney from Chiefs. And the kids love the brand Casey wow. Chiefs. Mm. Yeah. But you mm. actually have to invest money to do that. You have to get someone to tell those players to do that. Wow. But if you do it well, let me tell you, the mileage that you get as a brand is amazing. Wow. Mm. Sure. Wow. Uh, George, George, you mentioned something that is fundamental that mm -hmm. you can damage or you can enrich the brand yes. mm -hmm. when you are in the public spaces. Mm -hmm. But I've come across a lot of people, they will say, please talk to me in my private capacity. <laughs> or they'll put a disclaimer. You know, it's in a beautiful space where they could actually enrich the brand. But yeah. they say, no, please, I, I need to put a disclaimer because I don't have a permission to speak on behalf of my company. But he's an executive. Mm. Mm. What's going on there? <laughs> yeah. I don't want Mike um, to go, I don't want Mike to go to television and say, I, I, I work for Comesa, but please, I don't want to talk about Comesa. And he's going to talk about powerful thing, youth leadership, and then he says he wants to put a disclaimer. Mm. Well, but but uh, I hear what, what you're saying, that it can enhance, it can damage. So what, what, what do we do there? I mean, companies have policies that you should not speak on behalf of the company unless mm. you, have got a, you have been given a permission, even in mm. good times, good things. Mm. Yeah, well, so when, when, when a very senior executive says, puts a disclaimer, I don't have authority. Obviously, he's looking at the legalities to say, listen, if tomorrow if there's a hearing, I don't want to be in trouble, et cetera, et cetera. But mm -hmm. those are the things I'm saying, plan B should have taken care of. 
Mm. He should understand that when he's out there, he, st- he re- that's why part of the salary he gets recognizes mm. his seniority and recognizes the fact that he stands for the company. If he mm. say, let's say he's your vice president, and he says, oh, but I'm doing this in my personal company, there's nothing to do. What he's actually saying to, to the market is that we're not as organized in our workplace. And therefore, I might actually be held before a disciplinary hearing for saying this. Well, that's what he's saying to the investor who's sitting there. If I'm going to invest money in a, in a company and I'm hearing their vice president saying that, I know that they, somewhere in there they haven't done their homework around communication because now this guy is protecting his back in the public. Mm. Now, he shouldn't do that. He should be free to say, he should be free to say, listen, folks, I'm, I'm, I'm vice president of XYZ and uh, these are my views about this, about this and this. And that he explains that. And then he, he keeps quiet. Mm. By, by actually saying, guys, I'm speaking in my own personal capacity, the message is, I might be held before a disciplinary hearing, folks, so I need to cover my back. And, and you don't want that. And therefore, once, but at, back at the house, if we've already agreed that you can speak, George, you can mm-hmm. speak mm-hmm. about issues that are important, we trust you to make the right judgment. Mm-hmm. Because we mm-hmm. employed you mm-hmm. on the understanding that you're an executive with wisdom who will do things in the best interest of the organization. Whatever you say, you are doing it in the interest of the organization. You are not mm-hmm. doing it in your own interest. Sure, you will make a mistake somewhere along the way. That's fine. But we will empower you to stand out there and be a representative of us in all respects. You see what I mean? That yeah. is, uh, he, you should, so if he does make the mistake, ah, well, okay, sorry, we made a mistake. But nine Mm -hmm. times out of ten, because you have trusted him, you've put value in this guy, he's he's Mm -hmm. going to be very careful about what he says anyway. Mm -hmm. But if he's Mm -hmm. going to be talking about, uh, guys, I might be held before a disciplinary, so watch out. I know what type of organization he's coming from. And I can tell you, I'm going to be saying they need some work. Yeah. Trust him. (laughs) When, when, when When we come back from the break, I want us to talk about um, very powerful executives and what they do. Uh, we can take an example of uh, Elon Musk. Mm. Elon Musk wake up in the middle of the night and he tweets something about what is happening. You know, so so in that organization, if you are a PR. And unless unless they agree that tonight you are going to tweet and you can tweet about one, two, three. You know, and that is that is I want us to talk about that because uh, it can be very frustrating for the PR professionals when you have such powerful executives who themselves are rock stars. And and then you are a PR. But I'm just saying that I think this is very fundamental that uh, 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 leaders must understand that there is a certain discipline in terms of how how you need to execute the PR, the PR and the communication. Uh, uh, I mean, I take myself as a head of commerce. I, I, I spend a lot of time on media, uh, per se. And what I've picked up today is that I think you must always have, keep these things in the back of your mind in terms of what they do to, to, to what you communicate out there. And and, 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 and and it's not something that you just decide now I'm gonna talk. I want us to talk about that when we come back because we are players, all of us in this space, but very few of us are trained with the science of public relations and communication. And the fact that we don't get people calling us, hey, that's what you said there, no, it's not up to it. It doesn't mean that they don't make judgment. <laughs> I'm sure there's some, you know, if you are active in this platform, there may have time, Brother Sydney, there must be a lot of times where I, I don't know what's wrong with Sydney, man. He's, he's <laughs> <always close. laughs> but they never tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't get feedback. Yeah. <laughs> you don't get feedback. It doesn't mean that yeah. we should not work towards getting better. Yeah, yeah Mike. 
you know, you know, no, you know, your people see your tweet, five people comment, but there's hundreds of other people who have got different views on that tweet. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's important, uh, uh, Brother Sam, because we, we are already exposed, especially this kind of environment where things have gone digital uh, and we go into um, these social platforms without proper preparation. And, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and the view that was said before that uh, Brother George and, um, um, you know, Sister Bonisa is that we need to we need as we need to be prepared. Um, everyone, mm -hmm. I, I think we are we are a risk to an organization if we are not fully uh, upskilled and um, and uh, we are not prepared for this. Because in one way or the other, you will find yourself in that space. So, mm -hmm. but what we don't get is the feedback on what how much impact or how much damage or how much uh, improvement or enhancement of of where we are. We do. We, we can't get that feedback. People, as you are saying, people, you will make a mistake and people will be afraid to tell you the, the, the feedback. Mm. But I think also feedback is very important uh, because we are all pioneers. We are all new here. We don't know the space. Uh, and But we've got people who are experts in the space where when we are getting this feedback, it must feed us forward in terms of how we improve going forward. So it's not matter the mistakes that we do. For me, it's the response um, and the kind of reception of us being prepared to receive that criticism uh, mm -hmm. with a way to shape us to go forward. So I think that for Great. me, I don't know what Parachot says about that, yeah. We'll be back in 30 minutes. Amen.